In chapter 3 of our text, we're going to examine the glory of God and how the glory of God is illustrated by the beauty of creation. David writes, One thing have I desired of the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord. Yeah, think about this, is that interesting? Uh, what we usually think of in beauty is something we can see, but God is invisible. How is it that an invisible God can be beautiful? Interesting question. I would argue that true beauty is a holistic concept. And it is a holistic aesthetic appeal. It means that it isn't the result of one characteristic that something is beautiful. Something is beautiful if it is beautiful or pretty or attractive. Use that word attractive probably best. Attractive in more than one way. And that together all these different ways, all these different attractivenesses are woven together in an attractive whole to make something beautiful. Uh, it's more than, for example, physical attractiveness. It's not just, let's say you're talking about a beautiful person. A beautiful person isn't just one that's pretty or handsome, good looking. And we know this because uh, if you encounter someone who, if you think about it, well, that person is physically attractive, but they got to awful personality. It is really difficult to call that individual beautiful. It, it just, it, it just, part of you just says, no, I can't say that. It, in spite of the fact that they might be the most physically attractive person that you know, you can't call them beautiful because of this other trait that just isn't attractive at all. It's clear that beauty is more than just one type of attractiveness. The individual, the entity, the thing that is beautiful must be attractive in more than one way. Uh, and it's, it's the fact that these multiple attractive traits weave together in an attractive whole that makes things attractive, makes things beautiful. So if you think, apply this to God, the fact is that God has a number of attractive characteristics. His mercy, His love, His, his uh, loving kindness, all these things, these are, each one of them is attractive. His, the kindness of God is attractive. The, the uh, long-suffering nature of God is attractive. So there are multiple attractive, even though you can't see them, so there's not enough physical attractiveness to God. Nonetheless, each of His attributes are themselves attractive. And they're woven together in this very attractive whole, making then God beautiful. God's nature is itself beautiful because it's made of a number of attractive characteristics that are woven together in an attractive manner. So when we turn to David's comment, one thing have I desired of the Lord, to behold the beauty of the Lord. What David is actually talking about here what he's desiring is to behold the, all the attributes of God. He, in this, he's claiming that he wants to know God in the fullness of God. He wants to know all the attributes of God. The beauty of God is the awesome combination of God's infinite attributes, each of which is attractive. So when David wants to behold the glory of God, the beauty of God, he wants to experience the fullness of God. It's every aspect of God. If I can just grab hold of and experience every attractive attribute of God, that's when I am beholding the beauty of God. So we might read it rather superficially. I just want to see God's beauty. But what it really means is you want to know God in His fullness. In Isaiah 25, 28, 5, uh, God is, is um, called a diadem of beauty for the people of Israel, meaning that he is, he is 
for the Israelites, he shows himself as a beautiful being. Oh, the attributes of God are attractive to all the people around, and the combination of attributes are attractive, making God, uh, when he dwells on Israel in his fullness, with all his attributes, God is awesomely beautiful. And uh, at the same time, <laughs> God is invisible. He wants us to comprehend the awesomeness of his beauty, but each of those attributes are invisible. How does God allow us to experience the beauty of God? How can we see his invisible nature if, in fact, it's invisible? How can we see the beauty of God if the beauty of God is invisible? One of the ways, or a, a, a way in which God, in fact, illustrates his beauty is he creates physical beauty to illustrate his non-physical beauty. So, for example, in Job 40, verse 10, it says that God clothes himself in beauty. He clothes himself in physical beauty so that we can see his beauty. Again, we wouldn't be able to see it. We wouldn't be able to see God unless he did something to make himself visible. And what he does is he puts on beautiful clothes, if you wish, so that we can see the beauty of God. That's for our benefit. He doesn't need the beautiful clothes. We need the beautiful clothes so that he can see that. And then God occasionally appears to humans. He appears in such a way that people are impressed by the glory of God. Think of the uh, shepherds in the fields outside Bethlehem. All of a sudden, the glory of God appeared to them. What is that saying? The glory of God technically can't be seen by humans. What God did is he created magnificent beauty and, and showed him his beauty through that beauty to the shepherds. The shepherds saw something God created so that they could see something of the glory of God. Whenever this is described, that the shepherds with the, uh, in the temple, in the tabernacle, the glory of God is always described as bright, really bright, blinding bright. It's shown as brilliant. Words, it, it's clear that the writers very often have a hard time describing it. Shining, vibrant, uh, active, that the beauty, that the glory of God is something of this nature in the temple in Ezekiel. When Ezekiel describes what appears to be the temple in heaven, the glory of God fills the temple. So there's this concept that this thing God creates so that people can see his beauty goes right through walls, goes into every little room, goes into every little closet. It fills the temple. It has to because it's a picture of God's infinite beauty, of his infinite attributes. And so when God creates something to illustrate that beauty, it is awesome indeed. Revelation 21, we see that the glory of God lights heaven itself. In the future, in heaven, it's the glory of God that gives the light to heaven. And again, it seems to go right through walls. It fills the entire city. It's, it's not stopped by walls and doors and things like that. It's, it's an awesome beauty to picture the invisible beauty of God. <laughs> Invariably, whenever it appears in Scripture too, it scares the bejeebers out of humans. <laughs> it's so amazing. It's so awesome that it, it shows how... Well, it's so bright that it shows how dark we are. It's so, uh, it's so holy that it shows how unholy we are. And it really scares people. When those uh, shepherds saw the glory of God shown all around about them, they were sore afraid. They were scared. They, they, they sh their knees shook in this. They had to be assured by God, it's okay. <laughs> you know, don't be afraid. Because a great thing has happened. Because the response humans have to the awesome glory of God is fear. The sight of the glory of the Lord in Exodus 24 was like devouring fire in the eyes of the children of Israel. 
God in this particular instance had said, okay, I'm going to come down <coughs> and meet with the people of Israel. I want them to prepare for this uh, for three days. In three days, I'm going to come down and I want, when I come down, I want the people of Israel to come close. I want them to draw near. <laughs> and when the time came and the glory of God, again, something created by God so that these people could see it, came down, the, it appeared like devouring fire, which is scary. They were afraid. They backed up. They went away. Rather than draw close to God, they were afraid of it because it was so awesome. And Moses, a bit later, when he goes up on the mountain for 40 days with God, he comes back down. He doesn't even know it. When he comes back down, his face is shining with the glory of God. It's been in the presence of God. So much so that even his face scares his brother Moses and the other Israelites. It's uh, this, even the glory of God that God creates so that we can understand a bit of his beauty is so awesome that people are scared of it. In the book of Ezekiel, when it describes, when Ezekiel is trying to describe Christ, Jesus, uh, it seems as you read along that he's struggling to, to, to describe it. He tries to use words that he's familiar with. Uh, he describes uh, sapphire and fire and amber and a rainbow, all of those things. It's kind of confusing. You think if you, it, it seems that it must be vibrant, bright, colorful, beautiful, awesome, all those things. You can see it in the struggle that Ezekiel has there. Uh, when God creates a place where he lives, it's always a place of beauty because God is a God of beauty. When he created the Garden of Eden, he created it as a place of beauty. It's a garden. <laughs> he chose that to be a place that he would live with humans. And it was specifically a garden, a beautiful place to live. He put every tree in the garden. Here's what it says, Genesis 2.9. Into the garden he put every tree that is pleasant to the sight. He specifically filled the garden with beautiful trees. That's something I didn't notice for a long time. It was amazing. He, he specifically put pretty things in the garden because it's going to be the place he lives. It's going to be full of beauty. It was decked. This, uh, the, the, he creates the anointed cherub. So there's cherubs, and apparently there's a boss cherub. There's a big dude cherub. And uh, it's described in Ezekiel 28. This is a cherub who would fall and become Satan. But when he's created originally, he's described as being created with beauty and brightness. And he's decked with gems and gold. This is an awesomely beautiful creature. The function of this creature was to be in the presence of God. Those things in the presence of God are beautiful things because of God's beauty. The new Jerusalem in Revelation, the new heavens and the new earth, the new Jerusalem is described as being beautiful. It's described as prepared as a bride for her husband. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing prepared in, in heaven. It's got foundations built of gemstones. It's got walls of jasper, streets of gold, gates of pearl. It's a beautiful place. It's a place where God is going to live with humans, and it's lit with the glory of God. The tabernacle in Exodus, great detail, chapters devoted to describing the tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, we have sweet aromas, uh, incense. We've got textures, fine linen, fine soft linen, deep grained wood, acacia wood, fine carvings. Shiny metals, gold, silver, brass, translucent stones like onyx, beautiful dyes, blue, purple, scarlet. The temple, the tabernacle is full of beauty. It's full of all sorts of things. It's beautiful in things that you see, things that you feel, things that you touch, things that you, you hear, things that you smell. The tabernacle was designed to be a place of Beauty, and, and again, because beauty is this, 
all sorts of different attributes, attractive things put together in a holistic, uh, attractive whole. <laughs> it's every sense of the humans. It's, uh, it's what they can taste, smell, see, hear. Everything is beautiful. Again, giving us this concept that the, the dwelling place of God is full of beauty. Even the garments of the priest. Linen, that soft linen, embroidery, lace, gems, gold. And it's created for what purpose? It says for glory and beauty. Those, those clothes were created to be reflective of the God of beauty. Bezalel and Aholiab were chosen from among the Israelites and trained by God. In fact, they're called, it's said that they're filled with the Spirit of God so as to be able to cut and to carve and to sew and to engrave and to, and to produce all this beauty in this temple. God supernaturally inspired these people to produce enough beauty to picture these things. And it's all supposed to have been a picture of heaven where God lives. It's a picture of heaven to come and things in heaven and the things that are currently in, in heaven. The temple was also a beautiful place. God put it into the heart of Solomon to beautify the house of the Lord. The house of the Lord was to be beautiful because it's, it's the dwelling place of God because God is a God of beauty. Yet, and this is cool, with all that beauty, with all that awesomeness, and Solomon had a lot of it. He had gold, he had silver, he had, he had all those riches, and he could fill things with great beauty. Yet Jesus said, Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one lily of the field. <laughs> in his biological creation, God put more beauty into the biological creation than he even put into all of these beautiful things we've talked about. God filled the creation, the biological creation with beauty as an illustration of his beauty, the beauty of God. And it's not just a lot of beauty in the creation. It's an appealing array of all sorts of qualities of beauty. If you want to put it another way, there is beauty to the beauty of creation. <laughs> 